long-term living on another planet or moon or space station, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you need to shield people from the radiation. And so how do you do that? Well, I guess we could kind of take the same approach that we've been taking with the computers and we could just send three people for every task <laughs> no. that needs to be done. <laughs> Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Brian Mitchell so we can talk about space exploration, the past, space. present, <laughs> the past, the present, and the future. Man, you took me out of my groove, man. <laughs> hey, I gotta make my presence known. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED44. All right, so Brian, we're doing this episode right now because we're at a very exciting time. Uh, This month marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. Um, It launched on July 16th, uh, 1969, and they landed on the moon on July 20th. Uh, so yeah, this week, um, is, is, you're going to be seeing probably a lot of space related news stuff going around and people remembering, um, that, uh, that program in particular, Brian, this is one that you turned me on to. Uh, I've been really enjoying the BBC's, uh, 13 minutes to the moon mini series podcast, mini series. Um, yeah, it's, it's excellent. It's it's excellent. Like everything about it, man. Like all the way from the the interviews, they went and grabbed uh, audio footage from from archived uh, materials, and the the score for that that podcast is by Hans Zimmer. Like that never happens. <laughs> yeah, it's the production value is through the roof. Um, it's a really good job. They've yeah pulled out interviews, old interviews, voice actors reading from memoirs and other old materials. Um, it's a really good series. It's not quite complete as we record this, but I think they'll probably finish it this week. Um, I think they're going to be actually playing the raw audio from the 13 minutes that they went from ah. orbiting and to landing on the moon. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so the, there were a couple of things that really caught my attention in that in that mini series. Um, we're gonna we're gonna kind of use the Apollo missions as as a jumping off point here for this episode. We're gonna talk about from from then until now, where has space technology taken us, um, and then also going into the future of of what's gonna happen next. Um, but for for the Apollo missions, they of course like made huge huge strides forward in many technologies related to space exploration not just like you know building bigger and better rockets and figuring out techniques for um getting into and out of different orbits and everything uh but also like just the computers that they were using right um up until then like if you've seen the the movie hidden figures right they had those big giant supercomputers that filled up entire rooms right um but they also wanted to put some computers on the mission itself on the rocket uh so that it could do some of the like navigation and calculations and things um and for that they had to use integrated circuits which was a brand new technology at the time um and i think in in episode four of the the bbc uh program they they talked a little bit about this and and they were like yeah they bought 60 percent of the world's supply of integrated circuits just for the apollo program which is yeah they, they took a bet with using transistors and uh, clearly paid off. Something else that I thought was interesting about the computers is um, uh, memory. So they used core memory, which is where you have um, things woven in. So they would literally, when they would make builds and things, they would finalize it, and then they would have people literally stitch the memory of the entire program into some physical form, and that would be what the computer ran on. So it was a huge labor-intensive physical process to... Um, update and change the software once they had put it in the actual computer yeah but of course like the the fact that it was difficult to change was i think the point right because that made it more robust yeah it was for safety with radiation and vibrations and all that yeah definitely and that was you know kind of the technology at the time for for that i think hard drives at the time were very low capacity not that this needed that much 
comparatively, mm-hmm. um, but you know, high high power usage and it like that that computer was quite incredible. There's a book I think it's online somewhere on a NASA site that talks about the computer in great detail. Um, I read large parts of it a few months ago. Um, I don't. It was published in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. I forget which, but it's quite fascinating to read. Yeah, yeah, and it it really like illustrates a shift in the in the thinking of like before then everybody who was like making computers was thinking about like how big can we make this thing right but then the mission constraints were like oh wait how small and light can we make this and they got it down to like i think it was like a 70 pound uh little box that they put onto the uh onto the yeah that sounds spacecraft right. yeah um and also as the requirements changed throughout the years that they're developing it you know they would they put maybe a little more power in some places from the original specs and then by the end of it it was way underpowered from what they ultimately needed um mm. and you know there, there are portions of the at least the apollo 11 lo- um landing where they got kind of program errors because the computer was so overworked and so you know even more power would have been helpful but it was at a time when computers were getting um further developed and advancing at a very quick pace. And so when you have something that's locked from several years earlier, because you have uh, to yeah. build it and test it, it's, it's always, you're always pushing it to the limit. Oh, I remembered one um, other important thing because it was, it was pretty much, I think probably the largest um, computer effort at the time, you know, up until that point, they were kind of developing these concepts and, and patterns and practices of software development as a whole in terms I th- or I don't quote me on this, but I I think software development as a term was kind of created during the Apollo Mm, mm -hmm. computer development. Um, So just because you have so many people working on it, they had to just create all of these practices and things that kind of affects the industry today still. Yeah, because I I remember they were talking about how the early contracts that NASA would put out for... um, for the the manufacturers of the computers also stipulated that well of course you're going to be writing the programs for this computer as well because like every computer back then was just a bespoke you know unique piece of hardware so yeah the software was kind of an afterthought Mm -hmm. but it's you know yes it's it's um you need the hardware but the software was you know just as important um and that was kind of overlooked for a while yep Nobody had computer science majors from uh, from <laughs> from universities yet. Not, definitely not. <laughs> One piece of Apollo equipment is actually still functioning, which is really really cool. Um, each of the actually I don't know if it was each of the missions, but several of the missions uh, placed retro reflectors on the surface of the moon, um, and we've been using them to fire lasers from the Earth to those points on the moon to uh, measure the distance from the earth to the moon um and through that method we've demonstrated that the moon is moving away from the earth slowly over time um and it's also been used to demonstrate that the moon has a fluid core which is really really cool uh that uh you know the apollo missions even with their like you think about the the scientific instruments that they took with them they were pretty basic right but we've still been able to figure out that like oh there's a fluid core inside the moon even even with all that uh that equipment that they brought with them yeah um and so these are like basically fancy mirrors that they have on the surface that they um shine lasers at from earth and they could measure the reflectivity and time it takes to reflect yep you know light um something something else from the apollo program that's kind of still hanging around is the sample returns that they did Mm -hmm. um so where they collect moon rocks and bring them back um there's a, a interesting video that I think Smarter Every Day posted on YouTube just a couple of days ago where he went to the place where they store all of these lunar samples and, and see the process of how they're stored and the multiple layers of protection and things they have to go through. Um, so I know I remember reading a few months ago some of these samples hadn't been opened yet, so they were still un, you know unopened, sealed from the Apollo days because um, they didn't open them all in the 1960s and 70s because they... Um, we're waiting for better technology to be developed so future generations and things can can um, explore the samples and discover new things that they couldn't at that time. Yeah. That was pretty nice. Yeah, very forward thinking, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so like I said earlier, like a lot of 
the basic techniques for space exploration haven't changed a whole lot since the Apollo missions. Um, and in fact, like the the boundaries that we've been pushing with manned missions have definitely shrunk since the Apollo missions. It's still the farthest away from the Earth that we've ever sent anybody. Um, nowadays, almost all manned missions are just like low Earth orbit, going to the space center, the International Space Station, and doing experiments and stuff like that uh, in in microgravity. Um, but, like, unmanned missions are really where we've been pushing the boundaries of everything. You know, we've, we've had many, many different probes that have made it to different, uh, different locations and hit new milestones. Um, we've um, developed new technologies like, um, you know, originally satellites and probes were typically like used solar panels for power um and then they had like rechargeable zinc acid batteries as backups um pioneer 10 which was uh our first probe that visited jupiter and then it was the first one to visit the solar system um it also was the first to use a radioisotope thermonuclear generator uh for power when it got too far away from the sun to to be able to recharge and that's a technology that's still used today in deep space probes like that um yeah of course the scientific instruments that we use have have improved and we've got better cameras now than we did back then um yeah i think um the you know you like to to hear about the manned missions and how oh no we haven't left earth earth's orbit in 50 years or something but i think the unmanned missions are where we learn a ton they're far less expensive mm -hmm. and less risky at least for loss of life and public perception of programs um and yeah some tremendous things have been discovered through unmanned missions um the u.s in particular is is quite good at landing uh rovers on mars um yeah like i think seriously using a rocket powered sky crane to like land a massive rover that previously you know like they wouldn't have been able to do uh a traditional just like breaking via the atmosphere and then you know landing with with pillow cushioning and stuff like that <laughs> well th they had one in the early 2000s that was a inside a, an inflatable ball that yeah. bounced along the surface yeah it's crazy it's so fun to think about <laughs> um and of course like like you said with the uh memory that they built for for the computer on the apollo missions right it had to be very robust um nowadays we've come up with a lot of methods for like shielding computers and correcting for errors you know if they if if some piece of radiation like flips a bit or whatever um We've come or up you, with a lot have, of you know, like software solutions for that kind of thing as well. Or um, more hardware too, where you have three computers and they all run the program at the same time until they <laughs> get the same result. Because, you know, if, if something is flipped while you're computing it, you want to have um, it all agree or, you you know, you take the two that agree with each other. I know that's a, a practice that's done too, yeah. but yeah. And we've also uh, developed a lot of like methods for observing things in space without even leaving the ground, right? Like um, in in recent history, within like the last ten years, things that I could think of are like, okay, we've uh, observed gravitational waves for the first time using giant like perpendicular sets of lasers, um, neutrino detection, and and other like you know, small particles uh, have been detected by just, like, putting sensors deep underground where nothing else can reach them um, and just waiting for, for, you know, a neutrino to interact with some piece of matter there in the detector. Um, recently, we've finally had uh, an image of a black hole, which was created by combining many, many different um, telescopes from across the world into, you know, and stitching those images together using software to create one cohesive image uh, and ba basically like emulating a telescope with a diameter the size of Earth, uh, which is crazy. And using some machine learning and, and parts of artificial intelligence to kind of predict and project you know possible possibilities based on the data and then they kind of pick the ones that it looks how they would expect it yeah it's super interesting um i think comp computation has excelled um so much to where we are today that 
things are, are becoming more more possible that you just weren't, you know, decades ago. And I mean, I think we'll always be saying that, that technology in the last X unit of time has progressed so much more than some year in the past, but it's true right now. So it's going to be true forever, right? <laughs> just We're just going to keep going and thinking, oh, we're so much better than we were then. So speaking of where we're at right now, let's let's talk some more about the present of uh, of space exploration. Um, of course, we've had lots and lots of technologies that we use here on Earth as everyday consumers that were developed by NASA or by their contractors, you know, for space missions. Um, so things that you may never even have considered, like LEDs, artificial limbs anti-icing systems on airplanes, groove cutting in concrete to increase traction. Um, here's, a, here's a really crazy one that I had no idea about. Um, apparently, there are companies that are using surplus rocket fuel from NASA. Uh, they're using that rocket fuel in flares to destroy landmines without detonating them. Wow. That is, that's awesome. That's like the most bonkers concept that i've ever heard of like okay we're going to prevent an explosion by just firing a rocket at it okay (laughs) (laughs) um fire resistant materials that are used in building construction and firefighter equipment um here's one that you've probably heard of memory foam right tempur-pedic loves to advertise that hey this was this was developed by nasa you should use this product um yeah yeah freeze drying food um better solar panels right um (laughs) Early Internet of Things devices. I saw like an article from NASA from back in 2005 where they were talking about like, hey, we've developed this like combo refrigerator oven thing that you can control over the internet. And the reason it had to be a combo device was because like I think there there wasn't really a good way to get food from the refrigerator into an oven. So the refrigerator was also an oven. <laughs> The only way that you can. Right, right, right yeah. <laughs> um, Bowflex, apparently. I, I don't know much about that. Um, I, what is that? It's it's like, you know, the, the um, working out, devi- you know, like, instead of, like, lifting weights, it's like you're you're pulling tension on, you know, oh, okay. a piece of yeah, metal yeah. that's like, like a bow. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, like, countless pieces of software um, that you know, I'm sure have made their way into the the technology stacks that we use uh, in our everyday lives. Um, there's also a lot of technologies that are used in like healthcare um, situations that were developed by NASA. Um, and, and not all of them were developed by NASA for keeping astronauts alive, right? So there's like, there's a material that NASA developed uh, in order to be able to get a better seal in sample containers um, is now being used f- for stitches inside bodies, uh, you know, of surgery patients, so that they don't have to like open up those surgery patients again to remove the stitches later. Um, a- a artificial heart pumps that were originally designed to be like fuel pumps for rocket engines, um, and then also like algorithms that were de- developed to detect blood vessels in mouse tissue samples that were sent up to like the ISS. Um, those are now being used to detect cancer, um, which I think I think that's the same algorithm that Google was showing off uh, at like Google I/O for the last couple of years. Um, so I think I think that's the commercial application of that one. Yeah. So many technologies have come out of NASA. So, so many. And that's why we should uh, give them more than like one half of a percent of the federal budget, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, I think NASA's site said over 2,000 um, things had been spun off since 1976. So, yep. Lots of, lots of inventions. Uh, so let's get back to talking about some of the, the new techniques the new technologies that we're using to explore space um reusable rockets are a brand new thing uh we've only started to be able to like recover rockets uh after launches within within the last year right within the last two years um it's been more than two years has it okay um it, I, I was in college still so i think three or four okay um, but yeah like spacex four or five um, something like that yeah SpaceX is the only company that I'm aware of who've been able to like successfully land rocket stages after um, 
after they were used. Uh, of course, the the space shuttle was the quintessential like uh, program that was meant to have large parts of it be reusable. Um, but um, due to like the design by committee that happened uh, when when implementing that program, um, it actually wasn't cheaper to reuse those those uh space shuttles because like the retrofitting just took so much time and effort yeah it was more expensive than just building a whole new one every time yeah yeah um but yeah it, it seems like uh the the rockets that are being reused by spacex are actually saving money um which is pretty huge um and that's a big part of like what has made uh, launching small satellites become more and more affordable, right? So now we can have like little CubeSats and NanoSats um, that uh, that smaller companies can launch for whatever purposes they they need them for, um, which is pretty neat. Yeah, it it really lowers the barrier to entry, so someone can spend um, you know a dozen or two million dollars on a CubeSat instead of hundreds of millions, and and you know they're exclusive or or large parts of a single rocket launch. And so it, it really lowers the cost. It lets um, institutions like maybe even schools or something um, send um, satellites up to orbit Earth. Um, I think there have been several hundreds of these deployed in the last couple of years, um, I think. yeah, there have Which been does some bring us like to a, a new challenge. Like th- there's there's a new challenge of, of trying to track and you know coordinate all of these different small tiny satellites that are going to be uh filling up more and more of the space in space uh and making sure that things don't collide and you know create lots of space debris and yeah spacex launched uh i don't remember 40 or 60 or something like that of their um they have um a program that they're working on of of launching i think it's nearly two thousand small satellites for communication so they're they're trying to kind of cover the earth with uh, internet access and they launched 40 or 60 of these in a launch earlier this year and there are photos of just a stream of small satellites going through the sky um, so you can just see you know a bunch of tiny dots moving all along in a line mm. and i thought that's yeah it's kind of interesting uh so this brings us i think to the artemis program which is uh i don't know it <laughs> It wasn't. Re- was it recently announced? Was this the first time that we had heard about Artemis? Um, but I think the name Artemis is pretty new in the, in the last couple of months. As far okay. As I yeah. Know. Yeah. That's so when I started seeing it at least. Yeah, NASA has taken the um, directive to get to the moon by 2024, which is uh, I think the current administration's goal. Um, and they've they've created this uh, concept of the Artemis project, which is using several different pieces that have been in development for a while. Um, the Orion capsule is uh, the like the actual spacecraft that is going to uh, take the astronauts to the moon. Um, and the reason that they're that the Orion capsule is is kind of so key to this is that, NASA has been developing this. Uh, it's been in development since 2006, um, and it's it's the only like capsule that we'll have that is deep space worthy, right? So this is also probably the capsule that will be taking astronauts to Mars to whatever other destinations we're going to uh, out in the solar system beyond the Moon. Um, and then also uh, the SLS rocket, which uh, is has been in development for a while as well. Um, we haven't had a test launch of it yet. Um, I think they've had some test burns on the ground. Yep, they've tested components of it, and they're they're working on assembling the rocket now. I think they're going to launch the first one here later this year. Maybe okay. I. It, it following NASA social media, they're really promoting this more. I think they have um, the um, the the rocket crawler, you know, that goes to the launch pad and mm-hmm. things like that. They're putting it together, assembling the stages for the first Artemis One flight. Uh, looks like it's planned on June twenty twenty, according to uh, Wikipedia. Okay. Yep. Um, and unlike the the Apollo program, which had something like like six or seven. Uh, actual launches before they finally sent 
uh, you know, Apollo 11 to land on the moon. Um, the Artemis mission is supposed to just have Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed launch uh, of the SLS plus the Orion. Uh, Artemis 2 will take a crew on an orbit around the moon, and then Artemis 3 will, will be landing on the moon. Whoa. Okay. It's extremely uh, aggressive, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the Apollo missions and the Saturn V rocket, there was... Um, a couple different variations of the Saturn rocket before the Saturn V that they did some tests with. Um, I think it was Apollo 10, was it? Or maybe Apollo 9 that was very aggressive in terms of tons and tons of new things that were happening. So like the first time they launched on the big thing, they went to the moon and orbited it and they tested um, docking and just tons of new things. And it happened to work out. So they continued on and then went to Apollo 11. Yeah, um, I think was so that... a, a lot has to go right for this aggressive timeline to work out. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think um, what you were referring to, I think that was Apollo Eight, which was the first crewed mission after the uh, fire on on the launch pad that claimed the lives of the three astronauts uh, during Apollo Five or Six, something like that. Yes, yeah, that sounds correct. Yep. Um. Another key part of the Artemis uh, missions that we haven't mentioned yet is the Gateway. Um, So this is a space station that they are planning on launching in two different pieces aboard uh, commercial rockets. Um, And they will have that in place by 2024. Um, The reason that the Gateway is is so important is because, um, partially because of the the weight of the Orion capsule, the the SLS rocket, the propulsion systems that they're planning on using for Artemis, don't have enough thrust to get Orion from its uh, trans lunar orbit into like lower or yeah into low lunar orbit and then down onto the surface. Right. So the plan is to launch from Earth, uh, get to the orbit where the gateway will be around the moon and then from the gateway they'll transition into whatever landing craft they'll be using and they'll go from there down to the moon and then from the moon back up to gateway um so it takes it it should take a lot less energy a lot less fuel overall um yep so the the apollo uh program had basically two um vehicles right so the um, the lunar ascent module and the the other one I forget what it was called um, but basically you know the the third stage of the Saturn V would launch them towards the moon and then they would um, kind of take out the the lunar descent module and spin it around and dock it into the the other one and then they would that would go towards the moon uh, yeah I think then, that was the command module command yes command module thank you uh, so then the lunar one would go down towards the moon and then back up. So it was kind of a single-use vehicle. Half of it was left on the surface of the moon, and those are still there today. Um, and so they're very much one one use, um, kind of a throw it away kind of a thing. And so um, having one vehicle that can go from Earth to through deep space into and landing on the moon is pretty much too much for one vehicle. So a space station is kind of a hub, so you can reuse portions to go back and forth from the moon and earth and then maybe i i don't know if they're going to be reusable i i'm not sure of the ones that will go from the uh, lunar station down to the surface but also having a space station orbiting means they can you know they can get there and then decide where they want to land it gives them more flexibility without having to do it yeah all the way from the launch yeah and the lander that they're going to be using uh, for Artemis has not actually been contracted yet, but it sounds like NASA is giving their industry partners a lot more leeway on the design of it than they typically do. Um, so we'll see what they come up with. Yeah, I think that's that's going to be the... Because it hasn't really started yet, I think that's going to be the deciding factor of if we're going to actually land on the moon by 2024 or not, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from what I've heard. Um Things that NASA is going to need, uh, they're going to need a lot more money. They're going to need six billion to eight billion dollars more than what their ordinary budget is, um, and that money has not materialized yet. Uh, I know there there's been talks of like uh, 
what a one one point six billion dollar down payment uh, is what they're calling it. You know, just to like give give NASA this money right now, and then you know in in the future budgets like build it into each year. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen uh, as a result of the 2020 election, right? Um, if a Democrat is elected, they may want to distance themselves from uh, Trump's space initiatives, right? You know, um, I think Mars was more of the focus back during the Obama administration. Now we've got the Trump. It's flip-flopped a lot between yeah. um, Bush and Obama and now Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, seriously, people just... Just let NASA do its thing. NASA, in theory, NASA are the ones that know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, but that the administrator changes usually with a uh, different administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frustrating, frustrating. Um, speaking of of disagreements about uh, what we should be doing, um, Buzz Aldrin has started championing an alternative plan to to what Artemis is proposing. Um, he's talking about uh, building a something similar to the Gateway space station, but building it in low Earth orbit instead of low lunar orbit, which would give several advantages. Um, one, it can be used to stage missions to all sorts of de- destinations, not just the moon, right? So if you're going to Mars, like launching and boosting yourself to uh, translunar orbit is kind of silly like there's no real reason to be doing that um missions will be able to fly in already existing or soon to exist rockets right a lot of commercial rockets like the falcon heavy new glenn vulcan um instead of the uh, expensive and expendable sls right which is still in in development and we don't really know what it's uh what it's going to be like um if we have it in low Earth orbit, then it'll be much easier to have, like, you know, modules added onto this space station that will be available for commercial use, um, which would also help NASA to recoup some of the uh, cost saving or costs of maintaining this space station. Um, and then from low Earth orbit, um, the concept would be using, like, a, a tug, um, which is an adorable name for it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so this is So this is, like, a booster that goes up into space it's launched you know at some point but then never comes back down to earth and it just pulls things it you know it it transports uh our capsules from this uh space station in low earth orbit to lunar orbit um and and then it would be refueled uh with you know fuel brought up from from earth uh uh in commercial rockets um, and then also we would be able to just keep the Orion craft in space instead of bringing that back down to Earth. Um, and uh, and the astronauts, uh, in order to get back down to Earth, would use something like the Dragon or the Starliner capsules that we already have in use. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, a difference between um, uh, space exploration today versus in the 60s especially is the rise of the commercial companies who Mm -hmm. are building their own rockets and building their own capsules. So SpaceX's Dragon 2 had a test going to the ISS earlier this year or late last year where they had, you know, some mannequins in there and things. And they brought up just cargo to the space station. But in their new capsule, um, they did suffer a a rapid unplanned uh, disassembly on the ground, um, testing some... um, That's, That's code for explosion. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> um, testing some uh, emergency abort rockets. So I think they're you know being delayed a little bit, but that that is a capsule that will be used in the future. I think Blue Origin or Boeing or something is working on one as well. Um, and yeah, so if you have a, a lunar or an Earth station, you can use these commercial rockets that are being developed that are reusable and probably a lot cheaper than anything NASA could develop. Um, you know, if they just buy reusable ones, um, I think yeah, and like and using this and using the smaller capsules is is a huge uh, like cost saver as well because you don't have to launch a super heavy capsule every single time. Yep, it lets you um, do more with the extra weight that you can use. Um, I think there's there's talk of commercial crew to the International Space Station and maybe new commercial segments added to it. Um, 
And so I think that's something to watch over the next few years is how NASA is going to allow more private companies or I guess public companies to come in and um, do things in space where it's traditionally been more government run um, through NASA or other space programs. Yep. Yep. Um, one of the big challenges of a plan like the one that Buzz Aldrin is is uh, proposing is that we don't quite yet know how to like store and transport the chilled rocket fuel, uh, liquid rocket fuel, while in space. So that is uh, that's a thing that needs to be developed. Um, and somebody, I don't I don't know who it was, uh, who's who's an expert in that field, was talking about that. Uh, uh, if NASA funds this development, then it should be doable in about five years. Um, and I forget what the price tag was on that. <laughs> yeah, I know um, SpaceX has talked about with their their big Falcon rocket um, when, you know, because SpaceX would like to go to Mars as well. And so um, they have plans for fueling in low Earth orbit. And so I think other companies are working on this, too. I'm I'm curious how that will play a part and if they can come together and share technology or buy things from each other i don't know yeah yeah um yeah we definitely want to at least have all of the uh docking clamps be uh compatible with each other right (laughs) absolutely i think there are standards for that now yes yes um and yeah it's it's kind of like you know it it sounds like a great idea um but it's it is probably going to be kind of hard to to kill the momentum of the current Artemis uh, plans, especially since like the SLS itself is, um, you know, politically in a very good place because uh, NASA has spread the supply chain across all fifty states, and so like it has broad support in Congress because you know this this program is employing people in many different constituencies. So that was a politically savvy move by whoever it was who uh, set up the SLS uh, program. <laughs> now the SLS also is is quite delayed and very expensive and so i think some would argue that using a commercial rocket would be a better cost savings in the end um, yeah and just stopping development of the sls um and you kind of see nasa admitting to that a little bit because they have plans to send some of these things to the moon on commercial um, rockets so Mm -hmm. it's kind of a wishy-washy situation i think Next, we're going to talk about the future of space exploration. But before we do, I'd like you to hear about another podcast that you might be interested in. We've made difficult decisions. And there are still more ahead of us. Two people aren't enough to save the galaxy. We need the toughest. Smartest. Deadliest allies. We need you. We need you to join us. And listen to Reignite. A certain point of view podcast about storytelling. Love. And Mass Effect. Join us every other Thursday as we fight for the fate of an entire galaxy. You can find us everywhere you get your podcasts. Or at certainpov.com slash reignite. We're counting on you. We should go. So I think this brings us to the future. Um, So much like uh, what I was uh, talking about with technologies that we currently use that were developed by NASA, um, there are a few like recently developed technologies that have not yet made their way to the rest of us, but um, probably definitely will in the near future. Um, They are developing new ways of like... Uh, new detection systems like um, MIDAR, which is multispectral imaging detection and active reflectance. Um, it'll be cool to see where that goes because that's using light to detect stuff even underwater, which uh, was previously, I think, not really feasible. Um, we've got new propeller blade shapes that incorporate uh, different kinds of twists to make them more efficient and quieter. So um, those will probably come into play in like wind turbines and stuff like that right here on Earth. Um, yep new tire materials that use uh, shape memory alloys as load bearing components so that you don't have to use like you know a, a tire that's inflated with air pressure um, and uh, and it's still lightweight um, which is typically the the drawback for solid 
uh, tires. Yeah, tires, I'll just say, um, are something that NASA spent a lot of time on between the Mars rovers and the um, the car rover that they had on the moon during the, the Apollo missions. Um, there's I've seen several videos on YouTube um, about the the wheels that they designed. You know, they're, they're metal, they're not rubber, there's nothing inflated in them, and they kind of have to form and change their shape over the rocky surface a little bit more. And the, mm-hmm. the Mars rovers are more... Um, there, I think they're aluminum wheels um, for the weight, but you know you have problems with them tearing and, and puncturing holes and things. And so yeah, wheels yeah, are that, difficult. That is, I think there's been a couple of rovers that have like their mission basically ended because they got stuck, and then okay, well we're doing all the science in this location now instead of uh, continuing on. So yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, battery management systems that uh, can detect individual bad cells within a battery pack and then compensate for them to extend a battery life who that's going to be huge uh in in commercial electronics i'm sure yeah um definitely. software uh systems algorithms for uavs called safe to ditch that um you know detects if there's if there's an unexpected critical flight issue then uh it can land in a way that minimizes risks to people and property um which is probably not something that you know the like they're going to have to worry about while space exp- exploring right you know if you if you're crash landing on a foreign planet you don't really have to worry about like uh, running into a building but uh it's cool that they're developing that for you know for drones here on earth yeah um and then new new techniques for like folding and packing solar sails uh which brings me to um a recent launch here in summer of 2019 the uh the planetary society which is uh, an organization that was founded by carl sagan um the current ceo is bill nye so they've got some some big names uh behind that organization they launched a solar sail um which is like it, it's it's this big i think it's like four meters by five meters it's gonna that's the size it's gonna be but when they unfold it um it's only 4.5 microns thick and the the concept behind it is that it's going to capture photons that you know like from from the solar winds uh and use that to like propel itself around space uh so very very efficient in terms of like how much energy it, it has to output in order to get places um so yeah, that was successfully launched uh, late last month, and um, they're currently they're they're waiting for the other satellites that were launched along with it to kind of disperse a little bit and get farther away, uh, and they're going to unfurl the sails on July twenty first. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Um, and in kind of a similar vein of efficient, um, low power usage um, for thrust um, is the Ion engine, which is mm. kind of emits ions from atoms and stuff i don't know how it works but um i think spacex's uh communication array that i was talking about earlier i think those have ion engines on them Ooh. could be wrong but i know there have been a few tests with them maybe they don't i don't know but there's there are experiments a couple of years ago about ion engines and things um, and of course yeah we all we all know from star wars what those sound like yeah because there's sound in space yeah, exactly. No, they're 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 very low thrust, but they're efficient. So okay. they don't that they're not you know nothing beats rocket fuel burning right in a in a controlled nose cone and things. Or yeah, at least not cone. currently. The other one, yeah. Um, now one thing that that is a concern with like rocket launches is they they tend to not be very eco friendly, right? The um the the propellants that we use uh can be pretty pretty nasty um in particular uh hydrazine bearing propellants uh are a concern um and so there there are a few companies that are looking for alternatives to those um so ammonium dinitramide adn uh is is a substance that's being looked into because it breaks down into just nitrogen oxygen and water so that's that stuff is already in the atmosphere. That's normal, um, so not too bad. Um, the problem is that it doesn't usually combust until you heat it up to around 1,600 degrees Celsius. Um, so scientists are trying to come up with like different catalysts to use to, to help it to combust at lower temperatures. Um, 
also metal organic frameworks uh, are, are a thing that can be used at room temperature and they react almost instantaneously uh, when they're combined with their oxidizers. So um, that is a promising direction as well. So hopefully soon we'll have uh, more, more eco-friendly rocket launches. Uh, but then also before before you actually get stuff to launch, um, they have to clean all of the the equipment and everything that's going to go up into space, right? Um, especially like uh, uh, missions that are going to be landing on other planets, right? They want to um, get all of, like the microbio or uh, microbes off of them and stuff so that they don't contaminate other worlds. Um, and uh, and you know they they can use some pretty harsh substances to do that. Um, but they're coming up with a few new techniques, uh, such as using supercritical carbon dioxide. Um, supercritical means that, uh, you know, when you get it to the right pressure and temperature, then it has like properties of both liquids and gases. Um, and those can be used to remove like greases and clean small delicate parts with about 90% effectiveness, uh, which is pretty darn good. Um, also using plasma, which seems pretty pretty out there. Um, so basically they take hydrogen or oxygen, they put it in a strong electric field to kind of strip some of those electrons off of the atoms. Um, and then uh, you've got a substance with enough energy to like just rip away contaminants uh, off, of, off of spacecraft. Um, and apparently it doesn't damage the spacecraft too badly. So too badly, hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sure there's kind of a you know a, a happy medium there that you want to strike. Um, yeah, um, I know SpaceX with um, their plans to go to Mars. I think they're going to be using methane, which you can you know create from um, hydrogen and carbon dioxide and things like that. Um, so that's um, a good fuel that you can make in many environments. I think they're planning on um, harvesting ice and things on Mars to create more fuel to come back or do other things. Um, nice. Part of being eco-friendly is, you know, reusing the rocket. If you don't have to, um, you know, create all those materials to go into the rocket there, you know, you're going to have less mining and things like that. And so that, that helps with being eco-friendly as well. Um, something else to keep in mind. Yep. And fun fact on the topic of rocket fuels and thing and engines on the Apollo lunar descent vehicle, the um, the engine there was the first, I think, throttleable engine. Before that, you kind of lit oh. them, and they were just full power until you turn it off. Um, some some rocket engines too, I don't think can be turned off. So I think some of these solid fuel ones are just kind of they're on until they're done. And so um, that's technology that's developed over time as well. That's very cool. Yeah. Um. This is going to probably be pretty exciting for people now in 2019, but uh, you know, by the time this mission gets to where it's going, it's probably going to be like, yeah, whatever. Um, but we're going to be sending a flying drone to one of the moons of Jupiter, Titan. Uh, wait, Jupiter, Saturn, one of those two. Jupiter. Jupiter. Um, yeah. So, so Titan is the, is a target for this mission because it uh, has low gravity but it has a pretty thick atmosphere um and uh so they're they're going to be instead of like sending a rover that is going to roll around on the the surface and you know all the rovers that we've created so far you think about like okay they you know they they last for like many many years traveling around on the surface but they still they like they only travel a few miles in total um Whereas, like, this, this drone, uh, by flying from one place to another, it won't be limited by, like, uh, you know, rough terrain. It'll just be able to fly right over it. Um, it'll, I think it's supposed to go hundreds of miles is the, uh, the mission parameters that's set for it. Um, but, yeah, it, the, other, the other challenge there, um, besides the fact that, like, it's really cold there, so getting all of the equipment to work in that environment, uh, is also that, like, it's going to be super far away, so you can't you can't like in real time control its flight right so there's going to have to be a lot of like machine learning and algorithms to help this thing figure out like what is is an appropriate uh uh you know flight path and things like that yeah i think previous rovers on mars have been you know they're instructed go this 
go to this point and then wait for an instruction and that you just kind of check in and, you, and you're kind of like remote controlling it basically from earth where when you're flying in the air you know the the transmission time to get a signal from titan back to earth and then back to titan it would you know be way too long minutes and minutes and so that's you can't fly a drone that way so yeah it would have to be much more automated and purely robotic yeah i think that's that's quite interesting especially if our orbits uh you know happen to have earth and jupiter on opposite sides of the solar system right yeah definitely uh and now i have oh man i've got a whole bunch of notes from um a fantastic book called soonish by kelly and zach wiener smith um where they're just like deconstructing a whole bunch of different technologies that are in eh, you know the the middle to to far future and uh and talking about what the challenges are there um and and opportunities you know um so in terms of uh space exploration right of course price is currently the the major obstacle to doing like many more space missions um so like apollo really cool program but it was massive it costs so much money right we haven't ever done anything like that ever again um and it's and it's much more like impactful like we we get a lot more out of missions uh when we can just bring the price down far enough to make space travel commonplace right that's what's going to change our lives um so the two main ways to reduce cost in space travel is one reusing rockets like we said earlier um, but then also using less propellant Um, so yeah we, we talked a little bit about what we've done in the past for reusing rockets um i think we're actually probably in a much better place like in that area than i than we probably anticipated even five years ago um i didn't imagine that you know by 2018 2019 i was going to be watching like on a regular basis uh rocket launches where they land the rockets back on the ground and you know Got to be honest, those are probably the most like emotional experiences that I've had in the recent past is <laughs> watching SpaceX landing rockets. Yeah, that that first one was truly incredible. Um, and the, and the, the first launch of the Falcon Heavy, which I think is t- still the most powerful rocket in um, operation today. Yeah, yeah. And the the funny thing about that launch is that like I watched it the morning after, so I already knew that they successfully landed those two boosters. But like even so, watching them land like right next to each other on those two pads, I was like, oh my god, it's so beautiful. <laughs> did, did you see the Falcon Heavy launch a couple of weeks ago, where the center core went into the ocean a little bit off from the ship? No, you could, you could see it explode on video. Mm, I think you know. I think that was actually the launch where. The Planetary Society's um, uh, solar sail was on board. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I no, I did not watch that one. Um, there are a couple of like possible upcoming technologies that will allow us to reuse rockets more, like more readily. Um, space planes are a thing, which I'll talk about more below. Um, but also space elevators, which we'll also talk about more in a minute. So transitioning to using less propellant, um, there's a few ways to kind of fix that problem. We could have refueling stations along the way. So like the gateway um, idea in low Earth orbit, that would be one way to kind of have, you know, these refueling stations so you don't have to take all of this, um, all this fuel with you when you launch every single time. Um and a good way a good way to kind of visualize this problem is like imagine that you're going on a cross country road trip, right? You don't want to have to bring all of the fuel with you that you're going to need for your car from the beginning, right? Because then you've just you you basically are just like carrying a giant tanker truck uh behind, you know, like a minivan with 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 your cargo, right? <laughs> Uh, and then slowly using that fuel over the course of the uh, over the course of the trip, um, much much more efficient to just like stop at a gas station every, every like you know every other day or whatever. I don't know how much. And the the reason rockets are so big and things today is because well you, yes you have your payload at the top of the rocket but the vast majority of the weight that you're that you're launching is fuel to let you launch and so it's if you can reduce the amount that you need 
that really can help with um, making smaller rockets um, and which are far cheaper. Yep. Yep. Um, space guns are an idea. Um, unfortunately, with space guns, which you know is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's a giant gun that just shoots stuff into space. Um, you can't really send anything squishy that way, so you can't launch people. <laughs> Um, but you can send things like hardened electronics, raw materials, um, and you could like shoot stuff like that into orbit to like a factory that's up there already, and then they can assemble spacecraft there. Um, and you could base a space gun around like an explosion-based system, uh, or it could be railgun-based, right? So using magnetic fields to accelerate uh, accelerate our our cargo. Fun fact time. Um, when the U.S. was testing um, nuclear explosions and things, um, they had an underground test, and they had a, a vertical shaft that was, um, I think they had some some concrete to kind of cap it off, and they just put like a manhole cover on the top. But when they when they um, exploded the the warhead, it um, like vaporized the concrete, and then the amount of force in that shaft launched the uh, manhole cover, I think, into you know, out of orbit, it's probably one of the fastest things to ever leave the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. I think it's something like 140,000 miles an hour, which is far beyond the escape velocity, which is about 17,500 miles an hour. Yeah. And they, um, the only way that they knew like how about how fast that thing was moving was because it was captured there there was a high speed camera pointed at the manhole and it was captured in a single frame of that high speed camera leaving the area <laughs> yeah and so based on the assumptions of you know the theoretical slowest it could have been traveling mm-hmm. based on it being in 1000th of a second yeah yep 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 uh, we could also use lasers. Um, so you point lasers from the ground at the bottom of your spaceship uh, to superheat the air behind the spacecraft, which helps accelerate it forward. So basically that's like, it, it's still a traditional rocket system, right? But the hotter you can get the uh, the, the fuel that's being ejected from the back of the rocket, uh, the more acceleration you get. So just using like extra energy from ground-based lasers to uh, help uh, help boost that. Um, and apparently, theoretically using this kind of system, you could use like zero fuel for the first seven miles of your launch, which is most of the way up into low Earth orbit. Um, eh, low Earth orbit's like, I mean, the space station's like 150 miles e- above the surface. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Or 250, something like that. So it helps you get off the ground when the atmosphere is the thickest. Yes. So yeah, that's, I think that's what fuel. I was thinking of. Yep. Okay. Um, and then you can also use lasers uh, to make the air in front of the rocket less dense, which would reduce drag. Um, so that, of course, is something that you wouldn't be using when traveling around through space, but uh, for, you know, the launch itself um, could be useful. Uh, and then, of course, space planes and space elevators also help you to use less propellant. Uh, so let's dig into those two those two options because those both save on reusing rockets and also they save on propulsion. Um, so space planes are are kind of like a there's a there's a lot of moving parts in here, literally and figuratively. Um, so like a, an airplane has to use like a different type of engine depending on how fast it's going right so uh, a traditional like commercial jet engine um, takes in air using like a propeller at the front and it takes in air into its engine which is then like compressed and ignited and fired out the back right Um, but once you get going too fast um, I think the I think the sound barrier is is about where this comes into play Um, it's difficult to get all that, you know, air into, uh, you know, past a propeller. Um, so that's where ramjets come into play. And those are literally just like a, an opening, right, on the front of the engine. And the the sheer force of like how fast you're going is what presses all of that air into the engine and compresses it. Uh, and then you ignite it and fire it out the back. So ramjets 
very useful when you're going at like supersonic speeds, but they can't be used below supersonic speeds. So yeah, so like there's there's several different types of engines that you have to transition to as you increase the speed of a space plane. So that's where like the the huge amount of complexity comes in is like, okay, do we have separate engines for each of these different stages? Do we build one engine that can like convert itself from one to the other? Um, yeah, and, and some of these like haven't even been developed yet. So um, space planes, yeah, we'll see if they happen. <laughs> And and a lot of like plane jets depend on air being present to cool mm-hmm. off the engine, compress, and use for the um, explosion, uh, and that clearly doesn't happen the farther up you go. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I think, I think the, I think that eventually you just transition into regular rockets. Um, but like, yeah, the the advantage there is the the plane engine parts of that get you high enough to be like, okay, well now we're not worrying about drags as much uh when we transition to the rocket stage i think the concord plane um you know the one that that traveled faster than the speed of sound yeah um i think it used up like sig- uh, like many percents of its fuel just like taxiing and lo- uh taking off right mm. so it's so much more efficient for its fuel consumption at um you know high speeds that it used, I don't remember numbers, but I want to say something like 10% of its fuel taking off, right? Like a huge amount just to get to where it needs to be to be efficient. Yeah. And so rockets could be, or space planes or whatever could kind of be thought of as a similar challenge. Yeah. Um, space elevators are a very, very nifty idea. Um, so the concept there is that you have a base station in geostationary orbit so that's much higher than low earth orbit um and i think it's like 600 miles or more okay yeah and it's and it's important that it's in geostationary orbit because that way you can have this cable that reaches from there down to earth and because it's in geostationary orbit that cable will always be you know like above the same point on the earth so you don't end up having this cable that's just like whipping around uh in the atmosphere of the earth super duper fast um and then you you connect that to a platform on the surface of the earth um probably want to put that platform out at sea so that it can kind of like nudge itself around a little bit you know depending on like if there's weather or space debris to worry about um the other advantage of putting it at sea is that you don't have to worry about like oh now whatever country the the base station is in or the the platform is in kind of owns that space elevator right because if we can build one of these and lower the cost of getting materials up into space by that much that's going to really change like the geopolitical like kind of how countries relate to each other um because yeah so so having it be out there in international waters and have any any nation be able to use it uh is probably desirable um, this idea is so far from present it's oh yeah um, this is far so future you, you don't you don't have any material that's strong enough um and then you know additionally if you have a station 600 miles above the surface and it needs to hold the weight of the entire cable which would be an insane amount of weight um, it has to, you know, and keep it suspended. You basically either need to um, probably be further. Well, I guess the geostationary is a certain area. But, like, you know, just the weight of the cable itself is going to be always pulling that station back to the surface. And yeah, so and so it'll that's be why. It's very difficult to keep tension. And, yeah. One thing that I didn't know about the space elevator concept until I read this book was that. Um, in addition to the base station up in geostationary orbit, you then have to also extend the cable up a little bit farther and attach it to a counterweight. Um, so just just like a big hunk of mass, right? It could be an asteroid that we capture or it could be like, you know, we could put together something out of like a bunch of space debris. Um, and that, you know, adds kind of like extra like centripetal force outside of the geostationary orbit to kind of counterbalance the weight of everything below geostationary orbit. Yeah. 
Um, but if we were able to build one of these, um, then that should allow us to get cargo up into space for $250 a pound, which is a heck of a lot cheaper than we currently hold, can do I'm it. I'm holding you to that cost, Ian. <laughs> Yeah, when I, when, I'm definitely going to own the company that uh, that does this for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of concerns uh, with like making space exploration way way cheaper. Um. Right. The, the geopolitical upheaval that I mentioned earlier is definitely one of them. Um. We want to make rocket exhaust environmentally cleaner if we plan on launching lots and lots and lots of rockets. Right. Um, space junk buildup, definitely a concern. Um, and then also like having permanent colonies on other worlds could result in different populations with significant genetic differences, right? Because like, uh, you know, we, we set up a permanent colony on Mars, let's say that those people aren't going to be like coming back and intermingling with humans here on earth. Uh, a whole lot right because it's very expensive to get back off world and everything so um yeah we, we we are probably going to have to grapple with like what does it mean to be human in in a realm where we've got many different planets many different colonies and stuff um the, yeah th this is uh, a topic that fascinates me quite a lot it's you know the the problems that science fiction has been asking for years and years and years and years right you know what wh how do people react when they're on a new world in a smaller group of people how do their bodies change mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. what what are the political and economic and um yeah what are, what are the people problems and differences that'll happen because of that yeah um so yeah in in the meantime as we build up to that kind of uh that kind of society we're going to have like lots of big space stations um things here on earth will benefit a lot right because we'll have better satellite systems better communications gps um whatever other technologies like you know are developed for uh space exploration i'm sure we'll have applications here on earth um we might be able to uh, mitigate global climate change by constructing a giant screen in space to block sunlight. Um, space tourism is going to be a thing. Um, and also, here here's a very interesting thing that, that I hadn't really thought of before. But like currently, because space exploration is so expensive, we only have like big public sector government you know entities that are doing it right. And those are very risk averse, right? So during the, you know, Apollo program and everything, right? When they lost three astronauts, like that was a huge deal. And they had to change everything about their like operating procedures to make sure that they didn't lose anybody else during these missions. Once we have like commercial entities and, you know, just private businesses going up into space. Yeah, you know, like losing people is still going to be a bad thing. But, you know, it's it's not like, everybody here on earth gets all up in a frenzy because some uh you know fishers out in in waters around alaska right you know drowned um you know it's 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 a thing that is rather risky and we all just kind of you know have accepted that um so that's something that we're going to have to accept about space exploration as well devaluing human life yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, people die. It's a thing that happens. Yeah. Yeah, there there will be risks, that's for sure. Yeah. And that's something that I think um, you know, science fiction deals with a lot as well. Um, like when I was watching uh The Expanse, I was really struck by like, oh yeah, like these people are just treated like crap. And <laughs> hopefully we can avoid, you know, things getting quite that bad. Um, but yeah. Um, asteroid mining is also going to be a huge, huge thing. Um, and oh my gosh, there's, there's so much that I didn't really realize about like the, the whole concept of asteroid mining, because I think about space and I'm like, yeah, most of it's empty. Like there can't be that many resources, resources out there. Um, but apparently like number one, mining heavier elements here on earth is really, really hard because 
like as the earth was forming most of these heavier elements got pushed in towards the core of the planet so like you have to bring them up from really really far down uh in order to use them um asteroids are much smaller you don't have that problem right um and the the book gave this really striking example that like okay take the smallest metal asteroid that we know of that's in a near earth orbit um it's about 20 or two kilometers across so not very large uh and it contains more than 30 times the amount of metal that we humans have mined in our entire history that's one asteroid that's humongous like that's so much that's so many resources um so if we settle in space then we'll definitely have enough materials to support like hundreds of times as many people as we have here on earth um and those materials are going to be like super easy to get at right because we don't have to ship them up from earth so that's going to be a huge game changer um and in order to get that industry like off the ground <laughs> uh <laughs> if, <laughs> That's a bad joke. It's perfect. Um, it may be necessary to like ship, like you know, mine these materials and ship them back to Earth. But that's probably not going to be like where the money's at long term, um, because like yeah, we're just going to have like way more people out there in space, and they're going to be using the resources. So yeah, it it might not be as interconnected a a an economy as we imagine you know since all of the economies that we currently have that we think about are like oh yeah all all you know different areas of the earth where it's you know roughly equivalent to you know effort to get to all of these different places on earth yeah um there are some challenges uh facing us as we you know kind of grapple with uh asteroid mining <laughs> that was another bad pun <laughs> <laughs> Um, is you know it's it's hard to land on an asteroid. So like, it has been done uh, recently. You know, um, yeah, there are one or two one one lander that landed on an asteroid. Um, yeah, and like, and yeah. the really tricky thing about it is that each different asteroid is probably going to need like different techniques for landing, right? Because like, if you've got, um, like. If you if you have one that's kind of rocky, you could like drill into the surface of the asteroid in order to like get a good grip, right? But if it's a metallic uh, asteroid, that might not be feasible, right? So maybe you want to use like feet that are like really sticky, or um, you might just have to like clasp onto the outside of the asteroid or something like that, right? There's a lot of different like techniques, and they they're all going to have to be applied in different situations. Um, you could bypass that whole landing problem by just like putting a big net about around the asteroid and then kind of tightening that up and then using that as a landing surface. So you're landing on your net instead of landing on the asteroid surface itself. And then you just, you know, mine it from there. Um, but that still doesn't solve the problem of like, okay, if you've got a, an asteroid that's like spinning a bunch then you can't really stop the spin of the asteroid because that's like it's a lot of mass so that's going to take a lot of energy to stop the spinning um more than is probably worth the materials that are in it so like yeah you'll have to match that spin hum somehow in order to land on it i think yeah um there's yeah. also like political issues uh when it comes to asteroid mining because like currently international treaty says that no nation can claim anything that's in space, right? Um which makes me wonder like why why have we been allowed to like bring back samples from the moon and stuff like that, you know? I don't know. Um but the moon isn't space. The moon is a separate entity. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um I don't know if there are treaties about the moon or not. I think sure. I I would suspect that 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 space treaties cover the moon. Um, yeah. But yeah. So like, be. even though no nation can claim anything that's in space, um, the U.S. has recently passed a law saying that individual American citizens can claim space resources that they grab. So it's going to be a wild west situation. And companies are individual Americans, right? As we all know from Citizens United. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Uh. Um, also like as we mine asteroids, we'll be intentionally spoiling objects that have basically remained the same since like the formation of the solar system. So 
We might end up with like situations where we have asteroid park reserves or some sort of you know system like that to to help protect and preserve uh, the stuff that's out there. Um, and then also another another concern that was brought up is that uh, if you know as we reduce the cost for for doing all of this stuff then lots more people will have the ability to like do crazy things like redirect asteroids towards targets on earth or stuff like that right um and i mean i'm not super duper worried about that kind of thing me personally because as you as more and more people get the ability to do that also more and more people get the ability to prevent things like that from happening so i think it's just you know it's it's a everybody's power is going to increase, which, you know, should stay balanced. Sounds like a lot of science fiction to me, but we'll see what happens. That drives a lot of discovery <laughs> and technology. Yeah. Um, and then also, finally, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, re- developing new ways for shielding for long missions, right? Um, I think that's that's not really a, a system that we've put in place yet. Um, you could armor like the entire ship with lead but that's very heavy so that would add a lot to the launch cost um you could just armor like a small room within a spaceship like a panic room so that if they know that a solar flare or something is approaching then they can go in there um and then just you know deal with the fact that like oh we're just going to have normal amounts of uh radiation hitting us at all other times um or and this is one that I'm very interested in. We could line the outside of a ship with the water that they're bringing with them anyway for like the for the astronauts to consume. So I think that should be pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely a tricky problem that's going to have to be solved at, at some point. And I mean, even with um, uh, long term living on another planet or moon or space station, you know, mm-hmm. you're you need to shield people from the radiation. And so. How do you do that? Well, I guess we could kind of take the same approach that we've been taking with the computers, and we could just send three people for every task <laughs> no. that needs to be done. Oh, <laughs> uh, <I, laughs> yeah, until two of them dies and there's only one left. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I think uh, SpaceX and their the BFR rocket, um, that's redundant, the BFR I want to say they talked about using water in the in the walls. I don't know remember how the ISS does it. I know they have I think some more hardened hardened uh, capsules. I'm not sure if that's for like micrometeorites or space junk or if that's for radiation. But okay, yeah, certainly they have some processes processes in place for solar flares and other events like that. So. You know, I'm not entirely sure if BFR rocket is actually redundant because I don't think that SpaceX has ever publicly stated what BFR stands for. Big Falcon rocket is what I've sure the latest. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Uh, All right, so I think that's a pretty comprehensive discussion of space exploration over the years, where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going. Brian, did you have anything else uh, significant that you wanted to add? If you enjoy this podcast, I cannot recommend the podcast Liftoff enough. I think it's um, you can find it at relay.fm slash liftoff. Um, it's a great um, every other week. Um, Jason Snell and Mike, uh, sorry, not Mike Hurley. He's also cool. He's part of Relay FM. And um, uh, Stephen Hackett go over um, news yep. and events that have happened in the world of space in the last or previous two weeks um, so that's that's where i get most of my space news from and it's really an excellent podcast yeah same you you turned me on to that uh, podcast and i highly recommend it as well so brian where can people find you on the internet you can find me on my website which is brianm.me or on twitter at brian mitch l and i I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Uh, and this episode of The Extra Dimension has been a production of The Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts. You can find all of our shows at thenexus.tv. 
Um, this episode is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which was thenexus.tv slash TED44. Uh, if you want to discuss this episode with other listeners, please head over to our subreddit uh, at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And uh, if you have ideas for other topics that we can discuss here on the Extra Dimension, uh, please let us know. Um, I can tell you already that uh, next month we're going to be discussing um, bike riding as a daily form of transportation because uh, I have finally spent uh, a full year doing that. So I've got a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts and a lot of uh, a lot of experience with it now. So if you are somebody who uses your bike on a regular basis and you've got thoughts that you want to make sure make it into the episode, uh, hit us up. Uh, or if you are curious about this and you have questions for a couple of people who have been using their bikes as their primary form of transportation for a while, uh, also get in touch with us. Uh, you can email us at thenexustv at gmail.com uh, or find me on Twitter. So thanks for listening, everybody, and until the next one, have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological convergence. convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives. How do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.